Hey guys, Alan from V-Expressions here. Today we're going to go over the Pearl Mimic Pro Origins Pack from vexpressionslimited.com and we're going to go over the very important setup steps that you need to get it into your module, optimally performing at its best. Grab your USB stick, let's head to the computer. All right, if you haven't already, go ahead and stick your USB stick in the computer. Let that initialize while we look at the uh, expansion that you downloaded. Our expansions come in the form of zip files, and this is the Perlimic Origins pack from vexpressions.com. Uh, the zip file contains uh, very simple files inside of it, no number one being the README file. That README file will always say, please read the manual. In the case of the Mimic, it is very, very important that you read the manual because we have some very, very important steps in there you must follow to get the best results. Uh, we provide a quick start guide, which is actually all the steps in that setup process and some tips and tricks in there at the end. Today we'll go, we'll open and go through real quick the README file for the expansion itself. It provides an introduction with a description of the expansion overall. And by the way, our first expansion for every module, we try to make it very diverse based on all the emails that we get, uh, requests for certain kits, artist kits, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, in the case of the Mimic, it's no different. We've done acoustics, we've done artist kits, we've done decade kits, uh, era kits, if you will. We've done classic kits. We've done a little bit of everything, some ska, I mean, you name it, jazz, whatever. It's all in there. So if you haven't picked it up, head over to the website. The, the, link will be in the description and uh, pick it up. Uh, I think you'll really, really enjoy it. Uh, moving on, uh, this uh, introduction will tell you a little bit about the symbol set, how we module, modeled that within the module. Um, it'll tell you about the arrays of styles and stuff that uh, I just went over. Moving on, the kit listing description. Very important that you look through this when you first get your pack, and I'll tell you why. Because everybody has diverse desires and some people like acoustics some people like heavy rock some people like jazz some like just clean kits well we have all that in here and what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to look through this list to see what it is you're kind of targeting real quick so that you can go to it when you get up and running and like in the case of someone that likes acoustics your first four kits are all acoustic kits with not that much processing added to them they're just cleanly processed as if they were sitting in a studio prior to any recording and um but later on in the in the pack we have our maple kits they're not so all our all our acoustics are not together so you'll want to look through that list real quick just to get an idea of ooh I want to try that one for sure and I'll probably love this one and so forth and so on Moving on, our next page begins with our steps, and probably the most important step here, uh, besides backing up all your stuff, which is kind of a no-brainer, is that you must update your module, and you must update the library within the module. Um, without updating the library, you'll find your very first four kits in the pack don't have toms. You need to make sure you've got the library update from, I think it was from December. Um, we, the expressions, will always be using the latest downloads from Perl, the most uh, the most updated sounds, new sounds, you name it. We're going to be using that. So you need to get in the habit of always watching the Pearl site. Uh, if they provide an email list, I don't know if they do, but if they provide an email list, be sure to sign up for it so that you're notified as soon as those come out. Because every time you go to pick up an expansion, you're going to want to update your library if there's if there's updates available. Moving on, we're going to do the backing up our Mimic in person here in the video in just a few minutes. And right now we're about to prepare our expansion and copy it to the USB stick, which is really, really simple. And then we will, again, in a few minutes, go to load the expansions. One of the most important things in this uh, manual is the mixer level preparation. I spent a couple of weeks testing lots of different things, testing external sources, both in the recording side and both in the live performance side. I also tested, as you heard on the website, through our samples, a lot of the internal recording. When I did the inter when I did the site samples, I wanted to make sure that you heard exactly what the module's doing without any other touching whatsoever. I mean, literally, all I did was change them from that file format to an MP3 for the website. That's all I did, and I used the highest quality for the reasonable file size that I could. So there was no 
discernible difference between the two. Um, so what you're hearing on the website is identical to what you're going to hear in the uh, module itself. However, back to the mixer level preparation. Uh, during that time of testing, I found that the the best result was when your mixer was very consistent. Now, this is talking about your phone mix and your uh, master mix. And the reason I say this, and there's two se separate settings for all this, but the reason I say this is because I found that the internal mixer was really nice and clean and gave you a full 0 dB recording if your phones were set about 3 decibels down. Um, not counting your instruments, just your, just basically your output to your internal mixer. So, um, again, follow those, those steps in the manual and I will be showing you that as well here. And in the master, I found that it's sending a line level signal, which is usually equal to anywhere between minus six, minus 12. Um, I found it was a little bit lower in most cases. So what I did was I maxed out all the master mix. Uh, levels and I found that it was sending to the DAW super clean um, at a reasonable uh, decibel somewhere usually still between 12 and 8. Um, I don't think I saw much above 8. 10 was about the average that's what I'm getting at. That's a very clean very clean signal that you still have tons of headroom to work with so that's perfect. Most studios would tell you that's exactly what they want and finally I'll provide some tips and tricks here um, about routing, um, it's just some uh, quick uh, reminders that you can load any kit by just double tapping your kit at the top of the screen, scroll down and find the one you want instead of having to keep hitting that arrow. Uh, cloning, you want to make sure that if you're editing our kits that you're editing a cloned kit because you don't want to be restoring kits from your USB all the time. It's very time consuming. So anytime you want to edit a kit, just simply go to new kit and then clone give it a new name, and then edit that one. And then uh, the, uh, it, well, actually, I will tell you right here, the effects thing, I put this in all our manuals because over the years we've found that people, a lot of people like reverb, some people don't, but the vast majority of people do like reverb. So we make our kits a little wet, and some people complain about that. The guys that don't like reverb complain about it. The main reason we make them wet is because it's much easier for us to model a good reverb uh, think of um, think of Bonham or think of Alex Van Halen. You you want that reverb in there, but some people their ears are a little more sensitive. They don't want to hear that much reverb. It's simple. You just go to those instruments, pull back your reverb a little bit. And it, the reverb is only on certain instruments, only on certain things, overheads or what have you. Depends on where it's needed. Most of all, most of the time, it's in the instrument itself. It's not on an overhead. Um, with the cymbals, I do use reverb on the overheads to give them more shimmer, more life, more longevity. And then finally, we have a routing section here that gives you an idea of home recording, probably the best way to use the uh, Mimix limitations of 14 channels. You can always send your mains, which is identical to your internal recording, uh, minus the auxiliary in, and then you'll want to probably double up your bass drum layer, snare drum layer with the bass drum and snare on their separate channels, hi-hat and ride on a separate channel, obviously, and then everything else you can run in stereo. It is possible, obviously, to run your MIDI as well and do multiple passes to get those bass drum and snare drum layers separate as well as getting your toms separate. That's really the only other thing that I would uh, recommend doing, but just know that that's time-consuming. The routing I've shared here in this uh, manual is pretty much like an optimum um, for everyone to just get in the habit of using and so that's pretty much it for the manual. Uh, finally, you have a folder here that's got all your VEX Origins kits inside of it. This is the file that we're going to be copying over to our USB stick, and we will do that right now. Inside, you see those 50 kits. We'll go back. Let me move this over here, and let me open up my USB stick. So open up your USB stick, and yours will probably look radically different from mine. I've got lots of things here, and I'll go over some of them um, because I've found that some of my habits might be helpful to others. But quickly, let's show you how to prep your Origins kits. On a PC, you can usually work directly from a zip file. On a Mac, I think you have to actually extract it to a new folder. Now, I will say on the PC, you should make a new folder. 
Um, you can either right click the zip file and just extract all and it will do it for you. Or you can make a new folder, name it what you want. I suggest naming it Vex Origins so that later on when you're searching for it on your hard drive, it's easy to find. And then just copy all these out to that new folder that you are you have created. But in the case of today, I am simply going to take this Origins kit file folder and drag it over to my USB. And I already have it there. I'll go ahead and replace it. I forgot to delete it before this video. Anyway, um, so now I have it on my USB stick. So it is virtually ready to load, uh, except we will be going through those extra steps that I was talking about in the manual just to be safe. And so now let's look at our USB stick. Let me give you a few ideas, if I will. Um, as you can see here, I have my config. I always, and we're going to do this today, by the way. Um, we're going to create a config and we're going to give it a date. I find that keeping a couple of configs with their dates to show me when they were made and so that I know I have one that is up to date is, uh, is a good thing. And uh, I want to show you that I have a second config here. And I'll stop a second and give you something to think about. If you do home recording or you like to record at home or you do videos, whatever, and you also gig or you also go somewhere, uh, church or something and play, you're going to probably want two routing configs. Um, so what I did is uh, during testing, I tried a few different things. But th what you're seeing here in this folder is what I personally use. I have a, a basic config, which is actually the default routing configuration with all my uh, settings myself, obviously, outside of the routing. Um, but I also did a multi-track config that is for my recording here in the studio. And that multi-track is it's preset to all the routing out of my module, the 14 outs, into my DAW, ready to go. However, if you go to, let's say I was still gigging. I don't gig anymore, but let's say I was still gigging. Um, and my sound guy said, well, I can only give you eight channels. Okay, no problem. I would set up a routing for that with eight channels, and I would save it as uh, Vex gigging uh, config or something. And then that way, when I go to a gig, I can load that config, and I don't have to do all that routing, which takes several minutes. Or I can come home and load my multi-track routing uh, config, I'm sorry, and uh, again, in seconds rather than minutes, because with... 14 or 16 cables going from the kit to here. I've got to look at colors and decide, oh, where did that go? Did that go to three and four or did that go to seven and eight? Or, you know, so yeah, it's really nice to have separate configs as well. So keep that in mind. Uh, pad settings. When you do your pad settings, they end up in the root directory of your U USB stick. Um, and I want to show you that you need to do pad settings for every individual pad. Reason being is, for example, I have four auxiliaries, two are splashes and two are crashes. Those obviously all have different settings. And then I've got my bass drum. I've got my BT-1 that I use for all my cross sticks and cowbells, which also the expansion uses a auxiliary 5 of your pad of your choice. I use the BT-1. Um, I found that doing cross sticks and cowbells on auxiliary 5 far better than trying to do anything on a snare. Number one, you can't really model a cross stick on a snare. And when it came to volumes everybody's pads are different and you'd have to have your pad set optimally for the cross stick that I would design on that rim. So it made no sense to me to do that. And it also showed me why the vast majority of you are buying BT1s and using that for everything. So with the BT1, and I highly suggest picking one up, with the BT1 into Auxiliary 5, um, it's a no-brainer. I mean, you just plug it in, you set your sensitivity just like any other pad, and then everything's ready to go. The modeling is, is going to be, your modeling, your result on your kit is going to be the same as the result of my kit. Uh, moving on, crash one and two, obviously different settings as well, um, sensitivities and so forth. Those two are on my rack, so they're very similar, but they are different. Uh, Hi-hat, obviously, you want to have a have you definitely want to have a pad setting back up for the hi-hat. Um, that is one hard pad to set up. Ride, same thing. Snare, um, and then four toms. Four toms, same thing as the auxiliaries. Uh, you may have two rack toms that are identical in size, identical in manufacture and everything, but I guarantee you their settings are probably different if you set them up correctly. As tom three and four for me, same thing. But uh, it's you don't want to just save one tom pad setting thinking it's for all toms, and then try to use that on all four toms later. 
it won't work. <laughs> it will work, but it won't work well. Finally, I put a readme uh, thing in here just to remind me that if I ever need to load these, they have to go into the root directory. You may want to do that as well. And let's see, I keep my updates in a folder once I've done with those also go into a director, uh, the root directory if you ever need to revert or uh, update, what have you. I just like to keep copies of the updates. This is actually the library I told you you need to download uh, and update. I just kept it so I won't have to download it again. And finally, I keep a folder called hi-hat settings with manually pictures taken of my screen so that if I ever run into a problem with the pad setting itself and it's something's not right or I overwrote a file or um, whatever, things happen, accidents happen, that I can manually go back and, and fix my um, hi-hat pad. So I think we're done with that. Our USB stick is ready to go. So uh, why don't we head over to the computer and, I'm sorry, head over to the kit and get our, our kits in there after we back everything up and do some maintenance stuff. Okay, we're at the kit. I have my USB stick in the module. You can put yours in as well. You want to let it initialize from anywhere from 5 to 10 seconds, especially when you're doing saving at the end of the day. If you want to save your kits and you put your USB stick in, you go on to go to save. If it hasn't initialized the stick yet, then obviously you'll know because they'll tell you there's no stick there. However, you also want to let it sit for about 5 to 10 seconds after you do any savings of kits or what have you uh, because you you don't want to lose data. I one time turned the power off too quick after saving my kits, and I lost the kit I was working on at the moment. Um, it did save fine, I think, but when I tried to restore that kit, it was gone. The instruments were gone. So always wait 5 to 10 seconds before you power down the module after you do any savings of your kits. Um, so let's go ahead and go into our module and do a few backups. These are maintenance steps you should be doing almost daily, weekly. I'll talk about them as we go through them. Let's go. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to back up some uh, data. So we're going to start with our configuration. Let's go to our settings tab. And right at the top in the middle, you'll see export mimic config to USB stick. We're going to click that one. We're going to click yes. And then we're going to give it a name. It's easily noticeable at the computer. I'll call it config. And I'll give it today's date, which is 03-10-18, and I'll hit enter. Only takes a second. And now we're going to go ahead and do our user kits while we're here on the same tab. Click export user drum kits to USB stick. Click yes. Same thing here. Give it a name. It's easily recognizable. I like to give it dates. So I can keep multiples and I will hit enter. And again, that takes just a second. So now you have a folder of your config and you have a folder of your kits on the stick. We'll, we'll see that later when we get to the computer. Go back to the home button. All right, let's save some pad settings now. You need to save a pad setting backup for every single pad. Each pad is individual. When you need to load that pad later, uh, you will want to load that individual pad and not use the settings from one pad for multiple pads. Like a Tom, you don't want to save just one Tom setting setup and then use it for all four Toms. You want to save one for one, one for two, one for three, and one for four, because they're all going to be a little bit different. So let's go ahead and do that now. Let's go to our pad setting button, and you'll see here I'm on my kick, and I'll simply go to settings, save kick pad settings. The kick is a drum. And then I'll give that a name. Now I like to keep these very simple and short. I don't want to type a long time and I don't want to have to scroll through a list and read. I want to just look for BD for bass drum. So I'll hit enter. I already have it in there, so I'm going to hit no. If you haven't saved the backup of your bass drum or any other pads you're doing at the moment, uh, you'll want to click yes. So I'll cancel out of this for myself. And I'll exit. Now I'll do a symbol to show you a difference. Sorry, that's a tom. Toms would be the same. They're drums. I'll do a symbol real quick. We'll go to settings. You'll notice it says now save crash pad. So we'll hit that and we'll save it as a crash setting. Now, each one of these settings you're backing up, they have different parameters, obviously. Um, even though pads carry basically the same parameters, each one's a little different inside the mimic. So you need to choose the appropriate pad or when you go to reload it later, it probably won't load properly. So in this 
case, uh, my crash one is actually CR1. And I will save that. I already have done it, so I will cancel out, but you can hit yes. And finally, I'll do an auxiliary. Uh, on auxiliary five, I have a VT1 that I use for cross sticks and cowbells. By the way, all, not all of our kits, but most of our kits are already modeled for cross sticks and cowbells. It's just what's appropriate for that kit. I found that uh, trying to model it on a rim of a snare, it simply doesn't work. You, you can't model that. So moving it to a completely different pad is your best way to go. So auxiliary five is a VT, but it's still considered a drum. So here I would choose a drum, and then I would give it my br a brief name of VT, and I would save that. Now when I save, I'll show you where those go. They all go to your internal storage. Okay, They do not go to your USB until you move them to your USB. You'll see I've already moved some over here for the example for today, A through 1 through 4, which is basically a splash, splash, crash, crash, uh, the third one being a China, and then my VT. I'll go ahead and do the bass drum as well, just to show you. So you'll export that. It immediately goes over to your USB. It takes a split second. And then if you need to import one, let's say I want to import that VD, I can import it back over here as well, just by using this button here. I won't do that because I don't like taking chances. We'll exit out of that. We'll go back to our home page. So that's all there is for backing up your pad settings. I'll give you a scenario why you want to have those pad settings backed up. Now I've taken them from the internal to my USB, and I'll take those to the computer, and I'll back them up there. Let's say my Mimic went down a year from now. Something happened to it, got struck by lightning, who knows. And I send it back to Pearl to get it fixed, repaired, replaced, what have you. And I get it back, and it's completely default, brand new, spank, spanking brand new again. Well, all my pads are the same. So I wouldn't want to spend another week or two going through all the intricacies of getting a pad to respond the way I play. So I could just simply go to the computer, put all those back on the USB, load it right back into the new module, I'm ready to go. Literally takes just a couple minutes to load all those in. All right, let's move into loading RV Expressions kits. So I want to take a moment here to pause and remind you, you need to go to the Pearl website, and I'll provide the links below to get your latest update uh, for your OS and get your latest library update. The library update for our packs is very important because we always use the latest sounds that Pearl has released. Uh, in the case of the Orange pack that we're working on today, there was a library update in the fall of 17 that had reference toms and had a cowbell. We used both those, that set of toms and that cowbell on many kits. So you want to make sure you have those. If you do not get that update installed, you won't have toms on your very first four kits. I've already gotten two or three emails. I have no toms. And I said, you didn't do the update. It's section one in the manual. If you read it, you'll see, it'll tell you that you need to go there. It provides the links. And again, I will provide them below. below. So let's uh, move on to loading our, our kits. Okay, let's go to settings. Let's go to import drum uh, user drum kit archive from stick. And let's select yes. As you'll see, I have a few folders here. I have a sample backup I did today, and I did, uh, these are the kits I backed up on the 1st of March, and then I have the Origins Packs pack, which we copied over to the USB stick today. You would be loading this one by selecting that line and selecting Select Drum Kit Archive. I'm not going to load it because I've already put them in, so I'll exit, but I will show you what the result is. If you click, double click the kit name, scroll down, roughly halfway for me because I only have 100 kits in here, you'll see the VXO kits start right there. Any user kit you have will be saved. It will not be touched as long as you don't have a name that we have, which is highly unlikely. You'll see I have one user kit in here that I have not had in the pack. This is actually a new kit for the next expansion, and it was untouched. If you go through the end of the list, you'll see all our VXO, there's 50 kits there. Uh, again, if you have anything named after V, or VX for that matter, it'll show up down here. Anything named before VX will be up there. I didn't want to number these because I wanted to give you the names, and adding numbers uh, created longer names that stuff started getting cut off, and you may not be able You'd see Birch B. What's the B? You don't know. Uh, Birch O. What's the O? And you'd only see it when you were double-clicking to scroll down, um, which is fine, but I want you to be able to see it when 
you load a kit. So I'll give you an example here. I'll just pick the first one and load it. Now you can see the whole kit name. And some of them probably still get cut off, but I was trying to do my best to give you the full name so that you can scroll through them here real quick and still know what you're playing. So let's move on to our mixer settings. For the V-Expressions kits, this is very important. You have to do these settings uh, to get the exact result or better that you hear on our website. Uh, at the same time, you'll be able to tweak these to your heart's content, but I'm going to go over a few things that will probably make sense to you as to why we chose these mixer settings. So let's go to our mixer. And let's go to, first we'll go to the phones. I'm already there. And I want to show you that everything is set to 3DB. Our folders are closed at the moment. These folders, you can refer to them as buses because I'll show you here. The kick instruments are inside the bus. The kicks go to the bus. The bus goes to your, your main output. So my instruments, I'm running full blast 6 dB. I'm handling all my instrument volumes at the mic level, just like you would in a studio. Um, and you have to think of this module as a studio feeding another studio. So when we output from this module to front of house or a DAW, we want a nice consistent mix. And then you can do whatever you want at the DAW with direct outs. You can, you'll have headroom to further push them. So again, looking at the buses, you'll notice all the instruments are six, all the toms, all the cymbals, all the percussion. And then all your main buses, which the hi hat, Ride is by its uh, hi hat and ride are by themselves as well as the overhead room and reverb. Those are all at 3 dB as well. Now, this is the phone mix, and the reason I do this is because it creates a nice clean mix uh, that is going to your internal recorder and to your headphones that's not clipping. Clipping is also handled at the instrument level. I took very good care to make sure that you would not get any clipping on an instrument, and at the same time, you'll get the optimum recording inside the module at zero dB with the audio that you mix in. So let's move on. Um, let's go to our master mix. And you'll notice these are all at six dB. Now, why do I do that? They're all six dB because when I send to those external sources that I mentioned, front of house, gigging, uh, DAW, your church, whatever, uh, you can send, these are line level signals. They're not going to clip. They're actually going to come in low, probably around 12 dB. And you can max them out here to get a nice, clean, but loud signal, uh, loud being minus 12. If you go into the instruments, you will also see that the instruments are still still at 6 dB. Again, I'm, I'm handling all the volume at the mic level so that everything is coming out consistently. When you get to the DAW and start recording your direct out, you'll notice that all your instruments are consistent, uh, all consistent volumes for that instrument. In other words, uh, something like a hi-hat when it's recorded is going to be a little bit lower. You don't want to push that and have it start getting a little uh, clippy or a little bit uh, distorted. You want it to be realistic. And the, going through the mixer settings, as I'm showing you here, is what's going to give you that result. So once again, all our sub-instruments inside our buses are all 6 dB as well, all the way down the line. And as they're closed, you'll see the remaining buses, which will be your reverb, master, room, overhead, ride, and hi-hat. Those are all 6 dB as well. So this is how you would like to run the master mix. Once everybody gets in the habit of doing this, uh, trust me, it, it will be the best for everyone. So we're pretty much done here, and we're going to head back to the computer, take a look at what we saved, and then we're pretty much done for the day. And we're back at the computer, and I have my USB stick in the computer. Let's take a look and see what we've got. So right off the bat, I see we have a config with today's date uh, that the module made for us. And inside, we have all the settings that are not related to our pad setups or our kits themselves. So again, if you ever have to send your module off and it comes back completely white, at least you can put your config right back in real fast. Uh, this also brings up another point. I have my default config I named differently down here and I have a multi-track config. Um, if I got called tonight to go do a gig tomorrow and I was told I was going to have eight channels, I would load this config, uh, default config here at the top. 
that has no routing in it whatsoever, I would create the routing that they desire tomorrow night for the gig. And then I would save that, leave it in the module. I would save it on a USB stick, probably bring it to my computer and back it up as well. And then go do the gig and everybody would be happy. They'd get the eight channels they wanted. I got the eight out as I liked. And then when I get back home, I immediately want to go back into work mode with my multi-track and I would just come home and reload my multi-track config in the module, which literally takes seconds. Whereas when I first set it up, it took me about a half an hour to trace colors, trace numbers, and get them into my DAW and get all my channels routed. Uh, I've got a template in my DAW. It's ready to go. Why not just have a config I can load and it's right back to where it was when I started. So that's why I do multiple configs. You may want to consider doing that yourself. Moving on, we have our kits folder here, and you'll see we have the 50 VXO kits that we loaded. And I had one user kit on the module at the time, so I have the one kit at the top, and the rest follow are the VXO kits. Uh, you will see the same. You'll see your user kits. They may not be in this order if you have any that are named after VXO. Uh, if you have a kit that's called Zebra, obviously it will be at the bottom. But um, your, your user kits will be in there. I try to name our uh, kits uniquely so that they won't override anything you possibly have hopefully you'll never come up with a name that we release so uh, and you can also duplicate this folder and split those kits up if you like so that if you need to restore you know where to go find something faster so i could copy and paste this folder fix the name make sure it's correct with the right ending on it and then have all my uh, VXO kits in one, or all my in the future have all my VEX kits in one folder, and then have all my personal user kits in another folder. For some of you guys that uh, don't want to change your mixer, or you you want to change your mixer to match us, but you don't want to have to go through the work of changing all the mixer and instrument volumes on other kits you may have. It's this is a good way to um, between the config and the folders of kits. This is a good way to switch back and forth fairly quick without having to go through manually and redoing all the volumes across all the kits that are not the expressions. Um, in the long term, I highly suggest that you get in the habit of doing it the way I said because you may find yourself recording, gigging down the road where you want a lot more consistent signal from kit to kit going to the engineer instead of sending one kit to the engineer. He, he does everything for that kit. It sounds like a million bucks. And then you send the next kit to him and it's completely different. Something to think about. Moving on, uh, we have our pad settings here at the bottom. Those pad settings show up in your root directory. That's where the module puts them. As I said before, I like to put them in a folder that I have, and I call that folder pad settings with a date. And inside there, you'll see I have all mine saved from back in February. And I have a readme here to remind me that in the future, when I need to reload those, I have to move those back to the root directory to be seen by the module and be important. So that's that. Hey, I hope you liked today's video. If you did, you got something out of it, please give us a thumbs up. While you're down there, click that share link and share it over to the relevant groups on Facebook. Maybe we can answer some of their questions over there as well. And come visit us at vdrums.com. The forum over there is full of Mimic owners who have had this thing for well over a year. They know all the ins and outs and can answer all your technical questions. While you're down there at the subscribe button, click the bell and you'll get notifications of our upcoming videos. I have a couple series planned for the Mimic. One being I'm going to teach you how to create your own instruments, create your own kits. I'm also going to be talking about routing and recording and all the options you have in that area in another series. And finally, come visit us at vexpressionsltd.com if you haven't gotten your Origins pack of 50 brand new kits for the Mimic, or if you're a rolling owner and you're just curious and you watch this all the way through, we've got tons and tons of stuff for rolling owners we've been doing for almost 20 years. So come over and see what we've got for you. I hope you enjoyed today's video. I hope to see you back soon. Take care.